Inside Out is presented by HTC. This is life. Connect with it. And sponsored in part by Luke Rankin, Rankin & Rankin Law Firm. Experience you can trust. And by Clark Parker with Myrtle Beach CPAs, proudly serving the area for over 40 years. Oh my goodness, this is summer's last hurrah. Can you believe it's here already? Welcome to Inside Out. This month, we're going to Nichols to visit the Bailey Farm. We'll also learn about a new book about Polly's Island. We'll brush up on our pottery skills with Amy Cox, a potter from Myrtle Beach. We'll also celebrate the 30th anniversary of Backpack Buddies, and we'll have some great trumpet music from Bull Canty. But right now, I'm feeling hungry and I'm smelling something cooking in the kitchen here in Conway. This segment of Inside Out is brought to you by Clark Parker with Myrtle Beach CPAs, proudly serving the area for over 40 years. Welcome to the Crooked Oak Tavern. If you haven't been here yet, shame on you because the food is scrumptious. I was here for lunch and I've got 12 people coming in in the next week or so for dinner. It's a wonderful place, Chris Snyder, and congratulations because you're already doing well. Thank you, yes we are. I love your concept here. As we see here above us, it's all about the farm. Yes, it's all about using our local farmers and supporting our community and when you buy here, you're not just supporting me, you're supporting everybody else in Conway. Now you've got lunch, you've got dinner, and I'm wondering what some of your top-notch items are. Uh, of course, our steaks. I'll put our steaks up against any prime steakhouse. Uh, we get those local from a farmer here, W.K. Price. The beef comes from here? Yes. Hooray! Uh, our fish is caught right off the coast here in South Carolina. Uh, so we're always getting fresh, different catches, grouper, triggerfish, hognose snapper, whatever we can get that's great fresh local fish. And someone told me that your crab cakes were the best they had ever eaten. Why is that? Because I'm from Maryland. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and you know crab. Yes. So not a lot of filler. No, it's all lump and jumbo lump crab meat. Hooray. But today we've got scallops on the table. These are the biggest scallops, Chris, I have ever seen. Tell me about them. Uh, we get those flown in weekly uh, straight from New Bedford. Um, they are zero process scallops. A lot of scallops that you buy these days are soaked in some type of chemical to help them grow in size and also make them last longer. But ours, they're shelled on Wednesdays and they're flown here on Thursdays. Where's New Bedford? Massachusetts. And that's like um, the capital of the world for scallops, yes, isn't it? Yes, it is. That's the best scallops you'll ever get. Well, let's get into it. And you sure. wanted to show some folks at home how easy it is to cook scallops. Uh, it's very easy. You need four ingredients. You need the scallops, of course, uh, clarified butter or ghee, which you can buy right in the grocery store. Then you don't have to clarify it yourself. And just some salt and pepper. Let's do it. All right. And as a matter of fact, I want everyone to know that Chris is making a dish for us that he has won awards for. And he has a winter version and a summer version. And with this being August, of course, you're doing the summer version. First, tell me about the winter version. Uh, winter version is a smoked Gouda and bacon prosciutto risotto that, that we serve that's a underneath. Mouthful. Yes, it is. <laughs> but it is also delicious. Oh. And we've won two awards for that already. Uh, but in the summertime, the risotto is a little too heavy, so we go to something lighter. Zucchini is very prevalent here. Uh, so we do zucchini pasta with a pecan arugula. Uh, pesto sauce. Well, and we'll see the finished product here in just a bit. Let's cook up these scallops and I want to get a chance right, to sample so them. To get the scallop started, you want to put your uh, butter in the pan first. You want to get your butter hot. Anytime you're going to saute anything you want, whether it's butter or oil that you're going to use, you want that hot. Uh, so you get a nice sear on whatever product that you're using. So with these, uh, we're going to get our butter in the pan. Uh, as soon as we get this hot, we're going to get our scallops in here. We're going to put a little tiny bit of salt and pepper. Don't need much. A lot of times people think you need a lot of seasoning on food to make it taste good. Usually the product itself should sell itself. Should sell itself. If mm -hmm. you're using fresh, good product. All right, so we got a little smoke on our pan, so our pan is ready. As you're doing that, I want to remind everyone you're open six days a week, closed on Sunday. 
And uh, luckily, they take reservations because it's been packed. And why not? You've been open how long now? Uh, it'll be on July 18th was one year. Hooray. And you're doing well, and we're excited for you. Remind everybody where we're located in Conway. Uh, we are in downtown Conway on Laurel Street. Uh, we are inside the Blackwater Market. Um, we're one block off of Main, uh, so very easy to find us. So that's smelling good already. How long do scallops this fat and thick have to cook? Anywhere from eight to 10 minutes. So, so once we get a good sear on this side, we're gonna flip them over. Uh, we'll sear them again. And then we'll lower the temperature, and then we'll get a good caramelization on the outside. As they're caramelizing, I wanted to remind everyone lunch and dinner, but here's the dinner menu, barbecue chicken, ribs, uh, Carolina crunchy Dijon flounder, and listen to this, beef kibasi, beef jalapeno cheddar, and chorizo sausage. Is that how you say it, chorizo? Chorizo. And Maryland crab cake, fresh catch of the day. Uh, the scallops. Cajun chicken pasta, grilled portobello with avocado chimichurri. And that is our vegan vegan option. So Sounds there's like no, a... no cheese, no dairy, no nothing in it. So it's 100% vegetarian. That is wonderful for veggie people. Yes. Oh, and then there's Carolina shrimp, shrimp and grits, an all-American burger, and the list goes on. And of course, lunch is equally delicious. So, the scallops are seared on the other side. We're going to fade to black and come back up with the finished product. Drum roll, please. We're ready to plate up the scallops. It's been about four minutes. And look at them, Chris. They look great. Yep, we got our nice sear across the whole scallop. Nice and caramelized, so best flavor profile, and we're ready to go. We add a little bit of roasted red peppers in here, we're ready to plate. It's gonna be colorful too, between the red and the green, and this is? Our zucchini pasta with a pesto sauce that we use local pecans instead of pine nuts. Hooray, can't wait to taste All right, this. So let's get this plated up. You bet. We're gonna get our scallops here. Remember, this is an award-winning dish it won on top of risotto for winter, and this is the summer version. And with one month left of summer, oh my, look at this. Oh, this so is a perfect We dish. will get zucchini probably through the month of September, and then we'll look at going back with the risotto again once we get into the colder months. Are you impressed with the uh, variety of fresh farm products that we have here? Because a lot of people have no idea the variety of things we grow here. That was my biggest amazement. When I first moved to Conway and I started driving around, like, where are all these farms sending their produce? And that's when I really thought of this idea of wanting to do this is, why not support these farmers and keep our produce here and use it here in Conway? So how about you tell us about your lunch menu while I do the chore of sampling the goods? Oh, such a horrible chore, isn't it? <laughs> well, you know what? I'm our, gonna, uh, wait. I'm gonna share it with you. Now, it's hot. Let's, you might wanna blow on it, because I'm gonna feed this to you. If a chef won't no. eat his own food, you don't you wanna first. eat it. Oh. You first. Mm. Oh my gosh. The best scallop ever. Mm. Well, no, I don't know if I'm gonna share it. Okay, you, <laughs> you go ahead. Tell about lunch. Uh, lunch time uh, is completely different than dinner menu. Our lunch is definitely set up more for the business for downtown. Uh, people looking for a quick bite to eat, in and out. Uh, so it's a very different experience from lunch to dinner. It sounds wonderful. Lunch and dinner at the Crooked Oak Tavern. And since I've already used the fork, I want you to go ahead and take a little bite with your finger. And you tell me, not the best scallops you've ever had? Well then, I don't know where you'd go to get better. Amazing. I am telling you, Crooked Oak Tavern friends, come and enjoy lunch and dinner closed on Sunday, but be sure to make a reservation because they're filling up. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Mm, love it. Mm. Next on Inside Out, Beach Pottery with Amy Cox. No matter where the day takes me, HTC provides the high-speed internet services I need. 
HTC delivers faster speeds, 24-7 local tech support, and free in-home Wi-Fi right here to Ori and Georgetown counties. As trusted community members serving up world-class internet service, I know HTC will keep my family connected to what matters most. Because you are here, and so are we. High-speed internet starting at 100 megabits per second. Call today. HTC. This is life. Connect with it. Welcome to the home studio of Amy Cox. She owns Beach Pottery, but she used to own Albatross Pottery in North Myrtle Beach. And then you decided you could do it from home, huh? Absolutely. Tell me about this great business. Um, well, it started several years ago in college. I graduated from Coastal Carolina University. Um, and then just, you know, kind of smashed my passion of the beach and my love of ceramics together and decided, you know, we wanted to open the store in North Myrtle. Um, after a few years of overhead and headaches and heartaches, we decided, you know what, we can do this from home, uh, travel to festivals. We've been from as far north as Virginia Beach all the way down to Key West, Florida, doing shows. So. And you love it so much Absolutely. so you built a little kiln area <laughs> right outside did. your yard. I love my shed. Um, we built a kiln, um, kiln and glaze house, basically. Um, the kiln is way too hot to have here inside the home, so we had to move it outside. But um, it's my little, everybody calls it the she shed, but it's not really. It's just, it's my place to kind of escape a little bit and just get creative with um, the glazes and have all the hot stuff inside and stay cool inside. And your customers customers don't even have to come here because they can order everything online nowadays. That's right. I have an Etsy shop. Um, Etsy is just an online marketplace for handmade goods. And so I have a little shop set up there where um, my ornaments, uh, candles, wave bowls, um, basically everything is on there for a quick purchase. So they don't have to go through um, one of the festivals or they don't have to, even if they live out of state, they can have a little bit of beach right within reach. Speaking of festivals, you're gonna be part of the Craftsman Classic that's coming up this month in August. That's right. And I know that it's something you've done there every year. I always enjoy stopping by your booth it's always one of my favorites and I remember seeing your wave bowls there <laughs> last year this is something you have created and it's just beautiful absolutely your, your love of the ocean thank you absolutely yeah my love of the waves I just love um, the motion whenever I cut them out um, I just love the motion of being in the waves um, so I just kind of transfer that into um, something that's beautiful decorative but it's also Fun and functional. Well, and this is fun and functional, and it smells like the beach. <laughs> mm. Those are popular now. That's Love one it. of my favorite gifts. Um, I make the handmade vessel myself, um, and then it's also hand poured. It's a soy coconut wax, so it's very soft, very luxurious. You can actually use it on some of your rough spots oh. if you have some. <laughs> okay. Um, it has a very light natural scent, no phthalates, all paraben free. Um, basically, the, none of the ick is going into the air. And an unusual wick. A natural wood wick. Um, some of the cotton wicks uh, have some kind of pesticide or um, any kind of just nothing that's good to be breathing in. So those are all natural, self-sustained um, or sustainable wood uh, and it has a nice little crackle sound to it. Tell me about your truth jars too. Truth jars are so sweet. It's a really good encouragement gift. Um, it's a jar that is filled with scripture. Basically, I take scripture personalize it. I would put your name in the actual scripture. It's almost like a love letter that God is speaking to you personally, but put each individual scripture inside of the jar so you can pull one out for encouragement each day. This is going to be my new gift for people. I'm going to just call Amy. I don't have to go shopping anymore. Sounds Show me good. how it's done. And okay. I picked the palm tree, of course, the palmetto. Absolutely. Okay. So we have a brownstone clay. Um, and it starts out in a large chunk and what I do is I just take the rolling pin and roll everything flat and nice and even. Like biscuits. Absolutely. I can roll biscuits better than your grandma can. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of these templates I've drawn myself, drawn and cut out, and then I just take my pointer tool. And you mentioned to me that this clay is almost like a sand. It's actually, let it me is. hold up the octopus. 
you can see that this isn't just solid color. Correct. It is a sandy. A popular um, clay body is porcelain, which is bright white, but because I love the beach so much and I want to incorporate it into my work, this one looked the closest to sand, but it's a speckled uh, brownstone clay. Do you want to give it a try? You want to try oh. to cut some out? Oh, <laughs> I, I won't be anywhere near as quick as you. As I'm doing this, tell everyone, now notice I'm doing mine upside down because I'm that good. <laughs> so um, tell me what happens after you cut it out. Tell me the steps. Basically, um, if this was to fire by itself, the edges would be way too sharp. So we have to smooth the edges and I just take my finger and I rub off all of my fingerprints, <laughs> basically. There's um, a high grog value to this clay, which means it has a lot of sand in it. And I just take and smooth out all of the edges. So I don't want anybody cutting themselves on this. This is a good little tool here. That is my pointer tool. And then... Did you have any idea once you went to college that you would ever have your own business or was that your goal? You know what, I have to say, not uh, trying to toot my own horn, but I was very ambitious. Uh, there are a lot of art students that were using the fine arts degree as kind of a free pass, so to speak. <laughs> but I always knew I wanted to do something with it. I was gonna make um, a living I, I, I love the production part of it. I love making over and over and over again. I didn't want to make just the art pieces sure. that were, um, and those art pieces are beautiful. And I do do that every once in a while whenever I get tired of making the palm trees over and over and over again. But um, I just knew that I just wanted something for the everyday person to have that one little art piece in their hand. So that's just, I guess I always wanted to, uh, wanted to do that. So once you take this out to your, kiln, mm -hmm. then what? It fires for up to 1900 degrees. Once it reaches that temperature, it's called bisque wear. It's actually um, hard enough to where it can accept the glaze. Then I'll dip it into the glaze and then put it back into the kiln to a higher temperature of about 2400 degrees. And then that will do the final firing, the glaze firing, which it'll um, melt the glass and the pigment over the piece of pottery. And then you have your final piece. What is your favorite piece to make? Uh, I would have to say the wave bowls. Well, yeah. These are probably my favorite. And you make them in a variety of sizes, too. Yes, we do really large ones. Um, the largest is about 20 inches in diameter. Um, so that's our extra large guy. We call that the beast. And then we have the, um, the large, medium, and small. So some people use like the large ones for either a casserole or for chips, and then the smaller one for dips. So with two boys, mm -hmm. how old? Five and eight. Who are full of energy. <laughs> when do you have time to do this? Um, late nights and in between. In your pajamas. Yes. Um, that's the good thing about having the shed right outside of my door. I can get my jammies and my coffee and go, uh, <laughs> go turn on the kiln or check on the kiln or load the kiln. Um, but it, it's so much easier now that it's right outside my back door. All right, Amy, it's time to pull up my tree. Okay. And just slide it out just like this. It almost looks like a cookie. It like a does. a gingerbread cookie. It's making me hungry. <laughs> and then, of course, you'd smooth out the edges. Absolutely. Because you wouldn't want to cut your hand. I remember you saying that. Yep, and we pop a hole in the top. And then when it's done, it looks like this. Oh, how nice. And I then I usually just take a piece of jute string, just like this, slide it through the center so it can hang. Oh, I know I everybody can't. must love these. <laughs> Is this one of your hottest selling items? Absolutely. I also have um, the South Carolina ones that have the moon that dangle on the front. Um, I do the South Carolina states. Uh, but basically, right now, anything beach... Um, to hang on your Christmas tree, I can make crabs, shrimp, flounder. Um, I make all kinds of sea life. So if someone has a special request, they can also contact you. Absolutely, I can do anything custom. Um, I can also imprint the person's name, um, date. Some people like, uh, like whenever they have new grandkids, grandbabies, they put their um, birth date on the back or their name. Um, I can do that as well. Remind everyone, August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, you'll be where? At the Craftsman Classic Myrtle Beach Convention Center. And Diane, I'm really excited because my artwork is gonna be sold at the gift shop in the art museum in Myrtle Beach. 
Look for Amy Beach Pottery and Albatross Pottery. She answers to both. And we've got all the information right there as to how you can order from her online. All right, turning into a potter, what do you think? Do I have potential? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, <laughs> thanks Amy. Thank you. After this break, Inside Out introduces the Bailey Farm in Nichols. Hi, I'm Luke Rankin. Horry County is my home. I was born and raised here, and for nearly 31 years, I've been helping people. I'm an attorney. When folks need help after an accident, if they've been injured on the job or denied Social Security benefits, they call me. No screaming, no crashing cars here, just a serious offer to help. If you need legal advice or assistance, go with experience. Give me a call. Luke Rankin, Rankin & Rankin Law Firm. Experience you can trust. Mark your calendars now for the 37th season of the Carolina Master Chorale, kicking off with a concert of favorite showstoppers in Nights on Broadway. And this year's new twist to your holiday favorites is Christmas and all that brass. Celebrate a romantic Valentine's weekend with Music is the Food of Love, and they're ending the season on a hot note. Tango in Buenos Aires. Hold the dates, but purchase your season tickets now. Call or go online at carolinamasterchorale.com. Last month, our Inside Out cameras ventured to the Merles and Lefeau Parade on the 4th of July. And friends, we got mighty wet. It's a beautiful day in Nichols, South Carolina. Believe it or not, we're still in Horry County. This is the Spring Branch neighborhood, and I want you to meet my new friend. This is Jimmy Bailey. And Jimmy, a lot of people think that Nichols is exclusively in Marion County. No, ma'am, we, uh, we're in the very northwestern part of Horry County. Um, we're sandwiched between Fair Bluff, North Carolina, which is about three and a half miles down the road, and Nichols is about six miles down 76, and we're right up here in the very triangle of the, the county. It's just beautiful out here, yeah. peaceful, quiet, and we're here at a farm that you grew up on. Tell me about this beautiful home, which you say is over 100 years old. My grandmother's great-granddaddy, uh, Pap, and his son, Arch, um, started building the house probably before the turn of the century, but they finished it in 1903. There was no electricity back then, so it took them a long time to build it. So you said you were born in Barnwell, South Carolina, but you moved here as a kid, and so your home and heart are here. Oh yeah, um, I was born in Barnwell. My father was an x-ray and lab technician at the hospital uh, down there, and when I was six months old, uh, my grandfather wanted to come back home to help him uh, on the farm. And uh, my, my mother told me that uh, he was plying tobacco with me. 
when I was six months old, he was riding me on the 140. And so I guess that's where the roots started taking there. And my granddad taught me how to suck a tobacco. And I was probably four or five years old, is all. I couldn't even reach the top of the tobacco. <laughs> but he got me to get the ground suckers, and uh, he got the tops. I'll never forget, I still remember it. And, Aren't uh, you glad you don't have to do it anymore? Oh, yes, that's, that was hot work, hard work, but hard work never hurt anybody. It teaches you something, you know. Uh, it teaches you to respect the people before you, and it teaches you to make sure that you hold yourself up and work hard so you can teach the people coming behind you. So yeah. now you and your wife, Debbie, have raised a family here. Mm -hmm. And when did you stop growing tobacco? And what are you doing here now, oh, Jimmy? Um, well, I raised tobacco probably up to, I guess it was in, Lord have mercy, I don't really remember when I quit. But I saw things were changing. And I had to find something that could sustain, I wanted to find something that could s sustain my family and that I could leave to my girls. You've got a daughter on one side, mm -hmm. a daughter soon to be moving on the other, the other side. side, so it sounds like you did something right. You yeah. got the girls yeah. coming back to the yeah. farm. Oh, uh, uh, that's probably, that's probably the, my biggest asset is to know that my wife and me, uh, we, well, she did something right. She kept me kind of in line, but uh, your youngins come home, and the Lord blesses you with good youngins and good grandchildren. What more can you ask? Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me about what you're growing here now. I know you've got yeah. wheat. Wheat, corn, beans. Um, I grow that because I, I went into the, I, I put some hog houses in back in 94. And uh, you can't have any hog houses and you, you have to maintain um, your lagoon or holding pond. I have a holding pond, I don't have a lagoon. But, uh, and so I don't buy, I buy very little uh, commercial fertilizer, very little. Um, I use what the hogs produce. Right, and so just like the beans you have, we have here now, that's, the, the wheat's been cut now in June and we've got the beans coming up now. Uh, I don't put anything on the beans because I have enough left over from the wheat to make the bean crop. It, it's just a, it's a complete circle, you know, it's, it's, it's a complete circle. Same so, thing, year after year. Year after year after follow year. Follow that you, calendar. Follow the calendar. You, you know, sometimes you gotta, you got to be fast on your feet because the weather doesn't work with you. you got to be ahead of it or you get behind it. And if you get behind it, then you, you're behind planting your crops, and that, that's not good. But uh, What do you do with the hogs, Jimmy? What do I do with hogs? Well, i I, I got a company that, that uh, it's a small company, a very small company, that uh, they contract me to to take them from a feeder pig to a top hog. And so uh, I put them in the houses. I give them, uh, I give them the air and everything they need. And uh, it's a controlled environment. People say, well, it's a controlled environment. People say, isn't that hot? No, it's not hot because it's what we call tunnel ventilated. Um, you have a lot of fans in the back. The breeze, I mean, they're, you know, they're comfortable. They're nice, they're not hot. Uh, it, it's clean. And uh, I, I believe in looking after animals, you know. If you don't have a heart for animals, you don't need to be in the farming business. Uh, years ago, my, I'll tell you this, right here in the front yard, my, I used to have a BB gun and my granddad liked squirrels. So, so he said, he told me that I used to kill squirrels with a BB gun. I was, whether that's true or not, but I knew I killed a bunch of squirrels. I shot a bird one day. I never forgot it. Right here in the front yard. There's a lot more trees out here then. And I killed that bird. It still bothers me today. I took it and I showed it to my grandfather. I'll never forget what he said. He said, son, are you gonna eat that bird? I said, no, sir. He said, then why'd you take its life? He said, you want to live just as bad as you did. I never forgot that. Mm. I don't believe in doing anything to anybody or that you're not gonna, you know, be respectful. Wish more people had that attitude, yeah. Jimmy. Be respectful. I mean, animals, are, the hogs, what do we use the hogs for? Well, bacon and ham and this, that, and the other. Um, but you gotta treat them right. So I know that you and Debbie have done everything together here. Mm -hmm. She told me she even helps you with the hogs. Absolutely, she does, she does that. Uh, she, she's a hard worker, she's, uh, she, she lived in Loris. I met her at the beach, actually at the Galleon, and, uh, 
six months later, I asked her to marry me. And so uh, uh, that's, uh, we've been married 40 years. Wow. The, uh, but she, she's a hardworking woman. She keeps everything clean around here and at the hog farm. Uh, she suckered tobacco for me when I was on the road. Uh, she's, she's hoed tobacco. She's uh, picked cucumbers. She's, she's done everything. And that's, that's, she's unique. She's, uh, she's my wife, you know. And you're proud. Absolutely. I don't know if she is of me, but. Uh, <laughs> I know I saw a great mutual admiration society prior to starting this interview. But in wrapping it up, I think you kind of said it all in the beginning. Uh, your heart is here and you can't imagine having uh, a life anywhere other than the farm, even though it's tough work. Yeah. Um, you, you said you're not making anywhere near as much money as even your grandfather used to make. Oh, no, no, no. Back then, if you were a, when you were a tobacco farmer in the 50s and the 60s, uh, you were mister, you know? You, you, you had a lot of respect because they made a lot of money. They made good money. Today, it's, it's hard to make it. It's, it's hard to make it on a farm. You can't make it off corn, beans, and wheat alone. I mean, you, you, you've got to have something else. Uh, and my something else was, was the livestock, you know? And that's, that's how I could sustain, keep myself here. I, was, I wasn't born here, but at six months old, we moved back home. I want to be buried here and, uh, until the Lord calls me home, you know? Great way to end. Jimmy Bailey, thank you so much for being with us. And I want to thank Jimmy's daughter, Savannah, because she is the one who messengered me through Facebook and said, we would love to cover our farm. And so if you've got a farm that you would like to cover here with HTC Inside Out, just give me a call or message me just like Savannah did. Thank you so much, thank Jimmy. You. Thank you for coming. A perfect song for the summer season, right after this on Inside Out. Honey, I think I'll adjust the thermostat. It's getting a little cool. Mom, you don't have to get up to do that. I've installed the HTC Connected Home app on your phone. See, you can adjust the temperature from anywhere. Okay, Mom, I've got to go. Thanks for house sitting. Make sure to lock the door and set the alarm. No problem. I have everything I need right here. HTC Self-Install Kit, $0 with 36-month monitoring commitment. HTC. This is life. Connect with it. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church of Myrtle Beach. It's the beautiful new church between 38th Avenue North and 48th Avenue North on Grissom Parkway. And it's the place where this man plays music on a regular basis. This is James Bull Canty, and everyone here at our church just loves him. When he puts that trumpet up, there's not a sound in the house other than him. How did this all begin for you? Oh, my musical journey started when I was about two years old at Mount Olive AME Church. It's another local church here in Myrtle Beach. That's your on, home church? Yes, on 1108 Carver Street here in Myrtle Beach. and. As a kid, my grandmother told me stories of me running up to the piano and mocking the music director after church. Um, fast forward to when I was 11 years old at Myrtle Beach Middle School and Dale Hare fashioned me into a musical instrumentalist and I chose trumpet upon my exit from college after hearing Maynard Ferguson play live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Because he reached so many people by what he said through his instrument, I wanted to do the same. So when you saw him perform and you heard the crowds roar, that was for you. Yes, it, it's for me, it's communication with the audience. It's communication with every soul sitting in the room. Everybody has a story and my job is to connect with it through my trumpet. You mentioned your grandmother, Mary Canty, who is a dear friend of mine. And she always said, have you heard about my grandson? She was always so proud of you. She says she introduced you to the piano, if I'm not mistaken. She did. She bought me my first set of piano lessons when I was but four years old. And I remember them dearly to this day. So that was your first instrument? Yep, the first instrument was piano. And to hear my mother say it, I should still be playing piano. But of course, God had a different direction and I had a different calling. You played the tuba for a while. Yes, I was a high school tuba musician, an all-state tuba player. And I went to college at Brevard College on a full tuba scholarship. So. And now he's in demand all over the place, playing for the Florence Symphony, our Long Bay Symphony. But what has been some of your 
highlight, so to speak, Bull? Oh, goodness. Um, a lot of travel has happened to me. I've been very blessed to meet some people around the great nation of the United States of America. And the people that I fell in with most directly has been a band named Mr. Potato Head. Yes, you heard right, Mr. <laughs> Potato Head. They are a band based out of North Carolina, mostly out of Charlotte and Chapel Hill area. And they cover a lot of bases, including blues, funk, rock. You have things from the 1970s, things from the 2010s. And our biggest concept is to introduce people who haven't heard music to what it was like and to keep everybody who has been born into music entertained. So that band has been a very fantastic party band to play with. As far as classically, I have a lot of fun doing orchestral music right now. Um, Dr. Charles Evans here has been a great influence on my musical career, and Dr. Terry Robertson Florence has pushed me along for the past five years. And then, of course, you love to do Christian music, and churches all over the Grand Strand, as well as outside the area, call you from time to time, too. Oh, absolutely. Uh, my first album, actually, was a gospel album. I entitled it The Gospel According to Brass. Um, I dedicated it to my grandmother, of course. Um, when she passed in 2015, she was my greatest influence. And so the connectivity that she introduced me to with God has stuck with me all 41 years of my life. And so I feel like my calling here is to help introduce more people to music and to get them to speak a universal language. That's what I feel music is. It reaches everybody. Um, music talks to old, young, black, white. It doesn't matter who you are. Music has a conversation with everybody. And if I can do my job in introducing someone to music, then I'm all for it. You mentioned a couple of the musicians and some of the people that have influenced you, but mm -hmm. as far as the greats, who oh, do you man. admire the oh, most? Oh, man. Um, that list could be a mile long if you let it, but um, as far as trumpet players are concerned, um, my first major influence, definitely South Carolina's Dizzy Gillespie. I love Dizzy. I definitely love Miles Davis, you know. Um, Louis Armstrong, another great influence because he told a story. He went through, um, he went through everything at a time where it was just tense, where he had to fight against a bunch of people. And I love his story about, um, being on the front lines, uh, what's the name of the song? How are you gonna keep them down on the farm after they seen Paris? Makes sense to me. It's like, you know, uh -huh. that's fighting a, fighting a community battle, fighting an oppression battle and ending up coming out on top. Now, when I interviewed Dizzy Gillespie way back when in the 80s, he let me feel his cheeks. He called them his pouches. Can I feel yours? Mine aren't as big. They're, they're filled with dimples. Oh, come on, But come go on. ahead. Oh, God. Mmm. Almost like Dizzy, you're getting yeah, there. Yeah, that's about as much as it goes. <laughs> so in wrapping it up, if somebody would like to book you for an upcoming occasion, I know your game. Absolutely. Um, they can contact me at any time at my phone. My number is 843-685-6879. I am on social media on Instagram at Bull HLF, which means higher, louder, faster for anybody that's curious. Um, I have a personal Facebook page, James A. Canty. I don't mind if you contact me through there. If I have a chance to accent your gathering, let's go. Let's make music. And what are you going to play for us? I am going to play one of the Gershwin favorites. Everybody should know this, and it's appropriate for this time of year. I'm going to play Summertime. Mm, I got chills just thinking about it from Porgy and Bess. Absolutely. This is Bull Canty.
Coming up, 30 years of love and compassion from Backpack Buddies. Hi, I'm Wanda Howard, and I've known Clark Parker for a long time. Clark has been my CPA for the original Benjamin since 2006. He has proven himself to be knowledgeable, dependable, and available. I consider him to be an integral part of my business success. I even trust Clark for my personal estate planning. Small problems are large. Clark can help you navigate through them successfully. Clark Parker and Myrtle Beach CPAs, proudly serving the area for over 40 years. Enjoy the sights, sounds, and stories of the Long Bay Symphony under the direction of maestro Dr. Charles Jones Evans. Season tickets are now available for the Classical Masterwork Series, an exciting schedule that features the renowned Long Bay Symphony, along with world-class guest performers. Come experience the classical masterworks of our very own acclaimed symphony. For the best selection of seats, purchase your season tickets early, and for new subscribers, buy one and get one free. Call or go online today at longbaysymphony.com. This segment of Inside Out is brought to you by Luke Rankin, Rankin & Rankin Law Firm. Experience you can trust. It's the 30th anniversary for Help for Kids and Backpack Buddies. The organization now is just known as Backpack Buddies, and it was all started by this woman, Barbara Maines, and I've been interviewing her for a long time. She has done an incredible job with this organization, but Barb, it has grown tremendously. How many kids were you first serving 30 years ago? Maybe 30. And now? 3,000. Amazing. How do you do it when there is no salaries in this organization? I mean, even you working morning, noon, and night do not take a salary. No. And God bless you. That's why I call her mm -hmm. St. Barbara. But on the other hand, Barb, you must have hundreds of volunteers. We do. We have over 100, and they're all just wonderful. And where do they come to you from? Um, word of mouth. Not a, we don't advertise for volunteers except for Walmart. But word of mouth, yeah. We so, actually have to turn people away. We don't have anything for them to do. And that hurts me so much. Well, gosh, we don't want to turn anyone away mm -hmm. because you do need help. Now, you mentioned mm -hmm. Walmart. Yeah. What can volunteers do at Walmart for you? They go to Walmart one Saturday a month. They have the list of foods we need on a little paper. And at the go in the door where you go in, they hand them to people, you know, and the food is ready inside because Walmart lets them have it ready. People just get it, go through the checkout line, and then you got other ones waiting for you on the other end. Take your food, fill up a van. I know that feeds hundreds of children. I know that you have churches, churches, and civic yeah. clubs assisting you. Yes, civics club, churches, businesses, but individuals. I remember the days, Barb, when you used to go out with maybe one volunteer or two delivering mm -hmm. food yourself, but with mm -hmm. over 3,000 kids, you can't do that. So how many people do you have going out delivering the food? Well, it's according to time of year. Now, this time now, we've got, you know, probably 30 a week because we're feeding the kids in the summer, as we call it. You know, they're not at school. They're not getting that bag on Friday. They're there seven days a week. They don't have any food coming. So we go out and deliver enough food for a week for them. And the reason is you've told me is that these kids, when they're in school, sometimes that's the only meal they get. It is, that's oh. why we started the Backpack Buddies. The uh, kids were going to school on Monday and they would be mean. That's what the teacher said. They come in mean, they're irritable, they're... but nobody realized that they hadn't had anything to eat on the weekend. And they, uh, you know, and then of course you're not gonna do well so as soon as they started, you know, getting those bags, that was so many years ago, but they came in on Monday and they were okay, they were happy, and they did better, they learned better. What are some of the things you're now putting in the backpacks? Well, we try to put in some with protein in it, but we put things in that they like. Uh, we put spaghetti in the can, they love that. And their favorite thing, which a lot of people don't approve of, is Vienna sausage. That's their absolute favorite thing, but it has protein in it. It's reasonably, you know, inexpensive. And 
they wouldn't let me stop putting it in even if I wanted to. That's well, their favorite thing. <laughs> it is weird that so many people have made comments, well, that's not nourishing, yeah, nourishing right. for the kids. Mm -hmm. But they don't realize that many of these kids don't have stoves or refrigerators. Mm -hmm. They don't have, you know, electric can openers, no. you know, Vienna sausage you just pull. Yeah. And for many of the kids, it's something they can eat on their own without parents' guidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and ramen noodles is the second favorite. They love ramen noodles. And Barb, I know that you, um, when you go out different seasons, you mm -hmm. do different things. When yes. school's getting ready to go back into session, mm -hmm. you do what? They get new book bags filled with supplies. They get new shoes. And uh, we wish we could give them new clothes, but we're not that far yet. But they, they all get a book bag filled with supplies and new shoes. And then at Christmas. Oh, they get everything. <laughs> we can give them. <laughs> <laughs> Love Christmas. Yeah, they do, because they, they deserve the same things that... Other people's kids have. They deserve clothes. They deserve, you know. So our, what we do after we feed them, that's our main thing. We build up self-esteem. We give them self-esteem. And we tell them when they're little, we says, you know, if you'll go to school, learn, make the grades, we'll help you through college. And we do. Right now we have eight children in college. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, we love that. Yeah. You can brag about your kids. You certainly deserve to. <laughs> yeah. If you ever want to get a thrill, friends, you need to go out delivering food with Barb. I've done that. And I'm telling you, the kids run to her and flock to her like she is the Pied Piper, as you can imagine. I want you to also brag about some of the things you do during the year to raise money because everyone's wondering, how do you get the money to feed 3,000 yeah. kids? We have a lot of fundraisers. We have a lot of uh, businesses. Uh, civic clubs, churches, um, and individuals. Uh, Villa Romana is our big spaghetti dinner every year. And starting in January, people call up wanting tickets. They love it. Well, we love it. Well, and Fran and Ronaldo are wonderful people, and they don't take one cent. Not one Their cent. Their staff volunteers to do this. Amazing. Yes. And we, you know, you, they don't take anything, and we love them. <laughs> and then, of course, you got Jersey Mike's. Oh, yeah. Love them guys, yeah. They, uh... They do it every year. It's March 27th. It's called Jersey Mike's Day of Karen. And every Jersey Mike's on the Grand Strand, we get the total proceeds. And they brought us a check the other day, and it was just wonderful. So with this being the 30th anniversary, there's a real thrust to get people in the community to send only $10 a month. And what will that do, Barb? That will feed a kid for a month. That means every Friday that kid can go home on the bus with a bag of food. And they'll be like a kid's support for that whole month. And that's kind of amazing that that's all you're asking for from people. And it seems well, that that wouldn't hurt anybody's pocketbook. Well, yeah, that's true. And, and we're happy. I mean, we wish we had a thousand people could send a thousand dollars a month. But we know that, you know, people have a lot of, you know, things. And ten dollars a month, I just want people to realize you really can feed a kid for ten dollars a month. This is Barbara Maines heading up this organization for 30 years. Let's reach out and help her. No salaries in this organization. It is truly one of the greatest gifts to the community, this wonderful nonprofit known as Backpack Buddies. God bless you. I'm telling you, this is our local Mother Teresa. I don't care what she says. It's true. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. <laughs> A new book on Polly's Island, right after this on Inside Out. As fellow community members, HTC knows the precious value of family time spent together. That's why HTC delivers faster speeds, 24-7 local tech support, and free Wi-Fi. No matter where the day takes me, HTC serves up the world-class high-speed internet you need to stay connected to your world. Because you are here, and so are we. High-speed internet starting at 100 megabits per second. Call today. HTC. This is life. Connect with it. Welcome to beautiful Pauly's Island. We're at Hobcaw Barony, where my dear friend Lee Brockington works. But we're here today to talk about her latest book, which is all about Pauly's Island. And Lee and I have known each other for mm, about 35 years. Mm -hmm. We're getting younger. 
Yes, we are every day. You better mm -hmm. believe it. First of all, give me your new title here at Hobco. It's exciting. Yes, I'm coordinator for public engagement, and it's an opportunity to share the news at Hobco Barony with museums, organizations, libraries, and our institutes from the University of South Carolina, Clemson University, as well as our newest institute of the humanities with Coastal Carolina University and Francis Marion University. Where I graduated yes. from college, I was. I guess a student before it was cool to go to Francis Marion. It's now very cool. It's very cool, <laughs> and they're doing great things here. USC and Clemson both been here over 50 years at Hobcaw Barony. Even though Hobcaw remains, always has been privately owned property, we welcome universities and colleges to do research here. And we learn more every day. Well, I noticed too that this book is really great, and I was excited to see some pictures from days gone by. But Lee, you've lived in Pawleys Island, and you, I guess you left Columbia, moved mm -hmm. here about 1984, and I'm wondering if during your research, you learned anything new about Polly's. Oh, absolutely. I was a wannabe. We came on vacation in the summers, stayed one week. I thought I owned the place. I'd always dreamed about what if there was a full-time job, and I discovered Hobcall. Here it was the whole time. Got a job here, moved to the north end of Polly's Island, moved in right across the street from the grocery store owners, Frank and Faye Marlowe, and I hit the ground running, learning things I had no idea about. First of all, history. I learned that Polly's Island was a summer resort for who? The plantation owners, but not cotton, instead rice. So I began to learn a great deal more history than I ever knew before, whether it was summer history, like on Polly's Island, or throughout the year, like rice plantations. And I know, Lee, that a lot of people don't understand the difference between Polly's Island and like the mainland, and mm -hmm. I mean, there's two different, there's really two different faces. Yes, there are. The town of Pawleys Island incorporated in 1985, and it's just the barrier island. The town of Pawleys Island with a mayor and an elected town council, and Pawleys Island, the community goes from the mainland part of Waccamaw Neck all the way over to the Waccamaw River, and includes Highway 17, a number of neighborhoods, as well as those riverfront plantations, and today, golf communities. You ha had a partner in crime with mm -hmm. this book. Yes, yes. Arcadia Public called and um, the timing was such that Steve Roberts um, of, Bal of um, Maryland, um, married to Cokie Roberts, had just completed a book um, about Maryland with Arcadia Publishing and he called up and said, Lee, I've gotten a call from Arcadia Publishing and I said, me too. And he said, let's do this as a partnership and I was delighted. Steve Roberts is brilliant and we had- Internationally acclaimed. He is a great journalist. New York Times, He um, they live just outside of Washington, and of course, Cokie is more often on um, broadcast television, television, and he's in print. But we had a good time finding new photographs that had never been published, and Steve and I worked especially close with Julie Warren of the Georgetown County Library, especially Georgetown County Digital Library. We'd find the photographs, she would scan them, make them so that they were just right for Arcadia Publishing, and every page is, has as many illustrations. We went and found art, as well as maps and charts, in addition to some of the earliest photographs, which are, of course, at the turn of the 20th century. What do you think was the most incredible find that you and Steve came across? Was there a picture that you went, yes, 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 we found it? Well, and I think part of it was the photograph on the cover that your viewers will see. Um, it was awfully fun to see this image of a porch at Polly's Island, a hammock in the picture, rocking chairs, and especially this woman looking out at sea from the porch of the Summer Academy. And we know exactly who it is. It's Hattie Kaminsky, whose daughter ended up writing one of the first books on the history of Polly's Island, published in the 1960s. We also found out things like um, the pier was always a private pier. Um, the pier itself, the first one to our knowledge, was built in 1954, and then when it was destroyed a few months later by Hurricane Hazel, it was rebuilt. It was private, although the public could go on to it but it was always privately owned. Today, the pier is privately owned and closed to the public and creates some consternation 
The other thing that we learned that we thought was important to communicate was the fact that from the Waccamaw Neck, from Pauley's Island to Hobcaw to Georgetown, there was no bridge, no bridge to Georgetown until 1935. Wow. And no matter where you're from, a bridge changes the culture, bridge changes the economy, and not only to find out that one fact, but also to find out, so what did they do before there was a bridge? To really do some research on the riverboats that went from Georgetown all the way up to Conway, sometimes further up the PD River to Chiraw, South Carolina. And then when did the ferry boats begin operation? 1928. How exciting. And Lee, you know, a lot of people might not realize this, but Pauley's Island was built from farmers and families who came here to escape the the hot summers, right? Absolutely, and I remember Alberta Lashcock Quattlebaum, for so long part of the Lashcock family, owner of Waverly Plantation, said, you know, that Pauley's Island put us on the map, the term Pauley's Island, but for so long, plantation owners along that Waccamaw River survived because those white families that were plantation owners, slave owners, escaped the summer heat and bad air, malaria, by going to the beach where there was a strong breeze. They had no idea it was the mosquitoes breezing, breeding in the stagnant rice fields, flooded all summer long, six weeks at a time. And it wasn't until research about 1900 they figured out what caused malaria. And so many of those houses that were used by rice plantation owners before the Civil War and even after the war are still standing on Pauley's. The largest number of historic markers ever placed together in the state of South Carolina was on Pauley's Island the year we were able to do that in the late 1980s. So Lee, before we wrap it up, let's move away from the book for just a moment. What about fall programs here at Hobcaw? Oh, we are so excited because beginning in September, we have a whole new slate of programs and we are put, they're posted on our website, hobcawbarony.org, and you can sign up, register for those programs September to February. You'll know what we're doing here. And we have things that are um, standing tours, we have special programs, we have lectures, we have meals, we have Christmas programs, some are inside, some are outside, some are family, some are for children, and some are for people that love nature or love history. And at Hobcaw Barony, we make discoveries every day, whether it's through research or sharing. All of the programs are online. The Hobcaw Barony Discovery Center is open every day but Sunday. So if you want to do it in person, by telephone, or register online, we're ready for you to come and see us. And you can also come here to the gift shop to buy this book, but it's available other places as well. That's right. We're lucky to have it in our gift shop at the Discovery Center here. Also, Litchfield Books, my sister's books, the original hammock shop, and in regional bookstores, even Barnes & Noble. But it is easy to find, and I think easy to hold, and easy to consume so that everybody learns more about Polly's Island, just as we've done in the past 35 years. Wonderful, and the official title is? Polly's Island. Images of America, Polly's Island. How sophisticated is that? Lee Brockington, always a joy. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, enjoyed it. Remember, even though you're gonna feel like it, no jumping in the local fountain. Next month on Inside Out, you're going to meet a Nashville songwriter and musician who's moved to Pauley's Island. He's even written the state song and lots of national commercial jingles. Who is it? Well, you gotta join us next month to find out. And I'll see you then. Inside Out is presented by HGC. This is life, connect with it. And sponsored in part by Luke Rankin, Rankin & Rankin Law Firm. Experience you can trust. And by Clark Parker with Myrtle Beach CPAs. Proudly serving the area for over 40 years.